Luke 4, verses 21 to 30. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless, you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath's in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet, prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, they drove him out of town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Rejection, 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 rejection. That's the title of today's sermon, Rejection. Our opening quote for worship is from Kelly Coutrone. She writes, when you're following your inner voice, doors tend to eventually open for you, even if mostly they slam at first. We've all experienced rejection, personal, professional, social. When we get knocked down, we do our best to get back up. If at first you don't succeed, Try, try again. Nobody likes being rejected. Yet most great ideas come from thinkers, activists, radicals, whose initial reception, at least, was rejection, far more than it was being embraced by open arms. In today's passage, Jesus has gone from hometown hero to heal in about 30 seconds. What is it about his message that causes a crowd to turn on him so quickly? Well, I'll tell you, the exact moment where that happens. It was the instant the crowd realized that Jesus's vision was going to require them to change. That's what made them want to drive him off a cliff. Consider a moment what Jesus knew of rejection. It started for him right from the get-go with Joseph's rejection, then the innkeeper, then Herod, and it just goes on and on and on from there. Rejection, however, is not what marks Jesus as unique. What marks Jesus as unique is his clarity of purpose, his persistence, his insistence. Part of Jesus' strategy, from what I can tell, was to determine early on who was open to hearing his message and who was not. He sticks with those who are forward-thinking, who are willing to go all in, and he doesn't waste a lot of time trying to change the minds of those whose minds will not be changed. Remember his advice to the disciples, if someone does not welcome you, shake the dust from your sandals and move on. Just because a message is met with resistance makes people uncomfortable doesn't necessarily mean that the message needs to change. 
It may mean that we need to increase our tolerance with discomfort. Resma Menekin speaks of the need for white people in particular to understand the difference between danger and discomfort. If we are going to cultivate what Isabel Wilkerson calls the radical empathy required to do justice, we've got to increase our ability to be challenged by the prophetic voices of our generation. It seems to me that hearing has everything to do with timing and momentum. We hear what we can hear. We hear what we can hear when we can hear it, when it's loud enough or quiet enough. Or maybe when we've heard it enough times that we allow ourselves to be permeated by it. Maybe some of those people who want to run Jesus off the cliff the first time eventually become his followers. We don't know. What I do know is that truth remains true until we are ready to receive it. Our capacity to receive truth has a lot to do with what is, ex what is at stake. How much we stand to lose or gain. We have to want what we have to gain more than we fear what we have to lose. E An even playing field threatens those who are used to having their team starting with all the bases loaded. Jesus understood that his life was about fulfilling the text from the prophet Isaiah to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free, and that that was going to exact a price for those who had gotten comfortable with the way things were. Because remember now, at the end of last week's passage, in the beginning of this week's passage, passage, Jesus says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So it's not only that Jesus was about to do these things, but also that people who were being rallied to action their rejection of his message is about more than their rejection of him. It's about their own refusal to be called into action. These are the faithful ones. These are the faithful ones who chased Jesus, the messenger, off the cliff and refused to embody the good news. Have we ever done that? ever chased off the good news, rejected it because of what it expected of us. Psalm 118 verse 11 says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus and his message of liberation for God's people has withstood centuries of rejection and its truth still remains. Next week's scripture is all about calling the disciples. So the question I leave us with today is, who will we choose to be? Are we going to run Jesus off the cliff? Are we going to put down our nets and follow him? Will we choose comfort or progress? We have a friend who's recently been diagnosed with cancer and may be prohibited from receiving the care he needs because it's cost prohibitive. And Ellis Jane, overhearing our conversation, added her two cents. She said, all health care should be free. Universal health care, there's an idea. Out of the mouths of babe. And there's no question that people who are the poorest and the most vulnerable would benefit from having equal access to health care. People who are living with the crushing weight of medical debt and treatments deferred. But to create a level playing field in this country would require much of those who profit from the imbalance of access. How much brokenness in our world persists because we've made calculated decisions to live with it 
rather than to take personal risk. The risk that ensures God's kingdom coming into being would exact a great deal on us individually and collectively. How many times have we chosen to run Jesus off the cliff? The presence of God in our lives has the power to build us up. Indeed it does, but first we have to be willing to part with the comfort of the false gods of separation, othering, privilege, and pride. Here's the good news in this story. Rejection doesn't slow Jesus down. From generation to generation, his message persists. Bind up the brokenhearted. Care for the vulnerable. Set the captives free. Despite the violence and ignorance done to Christ's body, it still remains intact. Jesus's life was full of rejection. Our lives have been full of rejection, but it's not about how many times you get knocked down, said the great Cassius Clay. It's about how often you get back up. You may or may not be aware that the 33rd General Synod of the United Church of Christ adapted a resolution to recognize the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. It'll last from 2015 through 2024. So I will close my comments with a piece from Daniel Webster Davis called I Can Trust. I cannot see why trials come or sorrows follow thick and fast. I cannot fathom God's design nor why my pleasures cannot last nor why my hopes so soon are dust. But I can trust when darkest clouds my sky o'erhang and sadness seems to fill the land, I calmly trust God's promise sweet and cling to God's ne'er-failing hand. And in life's darkest hour, I'll look up and trust. I know my life with God is safe, and all things still must work for good to those who love and serve our God and lean on God as people should through hopes that decay and turn to dust. I still will trust. Amen.